Hallelujah. Amen and amen, brothers and sisters. We thank the Lord for the opportunity to continue our study on Women in Ministry, Course 109. And today we are in Lesson 3. And Lesson 3 is a very important lesson because it's the heart of the whole controversy about whether women should minister or not. So the Lord said, bring it forward from where it was in the former edition and deal with it headlong so that we can make progress in this cause. Let us pray. Father in heaven, the great I am who I am. How excellent is your name. Lord, by your spirit, speak to our hearts and grant us understanding. And let Yeshua be exalted. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, it's important that we now go to lesson three, having laid the foundation and did a synopsis in lesson two, let's now look at the instructions that seemingly limited roles of women, instructions given by Paul. And we need to give this, um, say this off right at the beginning. It is important to avoid using modern phrases and terms and connotations to judge scripture. Scripture should judge us, not us judging scripture. So those who make a habit of, you know, throwing stones at Paul and abusing him because some of things he said are inconvenient, they are in a very dangerous situation. If you accept the things he had written in other polite epistles, you now come to issue a woman, you want to abuse him, please don't do that. What you need to do is to study. Study, like he told Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.15, and study systematically, like Isaiah 28, 10 says, precept upon precept, line upon line. And then study differs from skimming the surface of scripture. It differs from parroting what a group of men or women may have said in a denomination. Over the past 1700 years, the church went from relationship to religion, went from kingdom to churchianity since the fourth century, there are a number of things that have been written that bear no on the, that do not conform with this truth, this truth of the scriptures. So the Lord wants us to have a simple heart. Like he said in Matthew eleven twenty five, Yeshua thanked the Father because he had hid things on the wise and prudent, revealed them unto babes. So there are threefold peculiarities of the Pauline epistles and a four-part framework with which you can understand what Paul said. What are those peculiarities? Number one, Yeshua, the head of the church, bypassed Peter and all the twelve apostles to give the master plan of the church to somebody who was an enemy of the church, Saul, who became Paul. And Paul could write in 1 Corinthians 3.10, according to the grace of Elohim, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builder thereupon, but let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. Can you imagine that? The one given the master plan of the church. So don't ever take in his word lightly. But number two, the epistles of Paul are not to be glossed over at face value. It is only sincere hearts, free of agenda, who can understand the divine instructions committed to his trust. And so a person like Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, things to come, be diligent that you may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our Lord, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some strange, I mean, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable, they rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So Peter said, listen, this brother has been given some deep mysteries. Don't just take it anyhow. You can cost yourself eternal life if you do. So we need to recognize that. Then number three, 
we need to also ask ourselves, what did Paul practice? So if we are talking about women in ministry, it's not just what did he write. It's not just understanding the deeper meaning. Then the question is, what did he practice? And Elohim has been merciful to ensure that the life and ministry of Paul is the one of the most documented. Apart from Yeshua, there's no other person whose life and ministry is as documented as Paul the Apostle. In the first place, the Lord gave him a medical doctor, Luke, to be his biographer. So Luke, who wrote the book of Acts of the Apostles, apart from the early part of the church, when you get to places where the, the direction of the wind shifted, and Paul was the principal person right away to the end. And then Paul himself wrote copiously about half of the New Testament was written by him. And by the grace of the Lord, he also had other brethren who were biographers who wrote with him so that he could dictate to them and they wrote. So life of Paul and what he said about women, whether they will serve with him or not, whether they could be accepted or not, is well documented. And we will look at them. So a better and more honest approach is to seek help of Holy Spirit to answer four interrelated questions which provide the best framework for understanding his instructions concerning the role of women. Number one, what did Paul say? Let's get it black and white. Two, were there some historical or cultural context in which the words were situated? Three, you know, sorry. Two, what is the fuller, deeper meaning of the instructions given regarding the role of women in ministry? Three, where were there some historical or cultural context in which the words can be situated? Then four, if we compare scripture with scripture, as Isaiah 28, 10 advocates, what would be the overall message of Holy Spirit to the church through Apostle Paul? Regarding the subject matter of women in ministry, answers to the four questions will bring the clarity we need. So using the aforementioned framework, question number one, what did Paul say? Let's see the passages that have been the stuff of very strong theological dispositions and some people have used to shut down anything to do with men in ministry entirely. What did he say? First, first Timothy 2 from verse 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Verse 12. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but be in silence. Verse 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Then in number two, one is First Corinthians chapter 11, 3 to 16. But I will have you know that the head of every man is Yeshua, is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonored his head. And every woman that prayeth or prophesied with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even as one, uh, even all one, as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, if for as much as he is the image and glory of Elohim. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For all, as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also of the woman. But all things are of Elohim. Judge for yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto Elohim uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man having long hair, it is a shame unto him? 
But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Then the third one is First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34 and 35. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also says the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, some religious leaders over the years have seized on these passages that was mentioned before to claim with finality that women have no place in ministry. And the outsized megaphone some of them have and employ has created a situation where Satan could not be happier, as will be explained in this course. We're going to see how it all fits into Satan's agenda. Now, explaining the Pauline epistles, now that we have the passages spotlighted, we'll do well to take the other three parts of the framework together so that we can flow according to the light to receive, which is number two question, what is the fuller, deeper meaning of the instructions given regarding the role of women in ministry? Three, what are some historical or cultural contexts in which the words were situated? Four, if we compare scripture with scripture, as Isaiah 28 advocates, what will be the overall message of the Holy Spirit to the church through Apostle Paul regarding the subject matter. So we're going to take some part today, and tomorrow we'll take some part in the next lesson. So as we proceed in this exposition, there are many things we will take note of. You can read them in your subject uh, in the teaching note today. But let's give some background to the church at Ephesus, starting with that. The one pastor by Timothy. Of all the mission fields in which Paul labored, Ephesus ranks as among, amongst the most challenging. He had apostle to the Gentiles encountered the worship of one of the ancient wonders of the world, the giant statue of Diana, the goddess of the land. The same is called Artemis, was called Artemis. And the same is Europa, the goddess of Europe, the same personality. The queen of heaven, also they call her, you know. Now, the worship of this idol was rocked by the preaching of the gospel of Yeshua and the kingdom. To the extent that one of his devotees, Demetrius, stirred up a riot against Paul in Acts 19, 1-41. And told the people, listen, if you allow these people, our business, which is making, you know, figurines of Diana, for, you know, which the world comes to make, you know, to buy from us and the business of running that call to Diana will miss everything. And the riots, they, 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 deal, they dealt with the apostles. The church that was planted in that city was planted with strong spiritual warfare. That's where he taught Ephesians chapter 6 on warfare, power evangelism, and deep teaching on the new nature and identity of saints, you know, and the New Testament. Listen, you can't get it better and the epistles to the uh, uh, Ephesians about b believers and who they are. Because it talks about the church of Yeshua. The church as the organic body of Yeshua, as the bride of Yeshua. So you need to read the whole epistle to grasp what these first converts where they stood. Unfortunately, false teachers had backslidden from the truth. They were praying on this vibrant church. In Acts 20, 17 to 38, Paul addressed the leadership of the church to warn them of impending invasion of false teachers and the effects of that pollution. Those false teachers were to wreak havoc on the church so much that when Yeshua appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos, he found them wanting in one vital area. They had lost their first love, intimacy with him. Paul was so concerned for the welfare of this church that he gave one of his best protégés, Timothy, to be the pastor, the bishop of the church. If you read Philippians 2, 19 to 22, it tells you the quality of Timothy, a faithful man, a dependable man, Paul could rely upon. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, Paul said, this is why I kept you. I allowed you to abide in, 
Ephesus, when I went to Macedonia, so that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give it to see uh, fables or endless genealogies, which means are questions. But, you know, so in other words, he committed that church to him, a faithful devotee, mentee that could, you know, relate well with him. So, men and brethren, what happened in that city? Jewish women in the city who embraced the new life in Yeshua were coming under a real culture shock. Gentile women who were loose in morals had unbridled freedom to do whatever they pleased and they dressed any way they liked and their fashion was very seductive. And because of the influence of the goddess Diana, Women in the area saw themselves as liberated to live anyhow, you know. So Diana was a female, she was a goddess. So as Diana was a goddess, a, a female principality, many women in that culture took it as an endorsement to enjoy a dangerous form of liberty and tendency to control and rule their husbands and indeed all men. And the, the, the church that was planted in this environment needed to understand some principles of kingdom culture. Those principles Paul instructed Timothy to teach had to do with moderation in fashion and the need for order and respectful lines of authority both at home and in the house of Elohim. So, let's explain the context of 1 Timothy 2, 9-14. Against this background, what was Paul really saying? Number one, decent and appropriate clothing should be worn by women who profess faith in Yeshua so that their liberty does not occasion stumbling in brothers who may still be in transition in their spiritual growth. So with moderation in fashion, they will not dress to kill in quotes, like hidden women around them. So Paul addressed the issue of dressing of sobriety and of, you know, how to appear in a way that was, you know, a, a proper in the house of Elohim too. Women who were coming into faith of Yeshua were instructed to concentrate on studying rather than seeking to teach and instruct others. If you look at 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 12. For Jewish women in the city, this opportunity to share fellowship and learn with the men publicly was an extraordinary one. Why do we say so? In the Jewish synagogue, they were basically on the margin like in the tabernacle of witness and in the temple, you had a court of Gentiles. Outermost court of the temple was court of Gentiles. Then you have the court of women. Then you had the court of Israel. Then you had the holy place where the priests and Levites operated. Then you had the holiest of holies. So they were on the margin. Now, those who were born again, if they went to a meeting of the church in the synagogue, they were all there together. So it was a wonderful and some couldn't handle that liberty. You know, and we're going to see in this course of this that there are people who, for instance, you know, let's say a preacher is preaching and a woman will rise up and say, no, no, I don't agree or whatever. And Paul was addressing, he said, no, you don't interrupt a meeting. You don't scream. If you have any question, you ask your husband at home so that order. Yes, we have liberty, but there's order in the house of Elohim. And the place the, uh, the wives, you know, are subject to their husbands, you know. So even though the, the faith in Yeshua had broken down the middle of partition between Jews and Gentiles, some people were now thinking it meant that there was no more order at all. You could do anything, speak anything, debate. And Paul said, no, there is order in the house of Elohim. Number three, in verse 12, Paul was speaking to married women, not to use up the authority of their husbands, but to be submitted to them. This is consistent with the teachings of marriage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and Ephesians chapter 5, 22 to 32. We need to know that the word usurp clearly implied an illegal power grab by one who is not authorized. If a woman is not called but tries to use her husband, for instance, if a man is called to ministry and is a pastor of a church and the wife who is not called now tries to use his office to further her personal agenda and manipulates him through emotion, through you know, different ways of control to do her bidding, not what the Lord wanted, that is an illegal power grab. 
because the one lawfully installed to office is no longer obeying the Lord, but now obeying the one who is doing the manipulation and his oppression. Number four, the truth needs to be clearly stressed that there is no way Paul, who was used to reveal that sisters are simply sons of Elohim in female bodies with equal access and rank in the kingdom to brothers, would in the same breath summarily decree all women, single, all women, you know, as unfit, even the married women, and they were subject to their husbands, as the Bible says, that they were fit to be used by the Lord. There's no way. And this is what this course will explain in detail without name calling. We respect Paul. He is the master builder of the church. Nobody should ever call him names because he wrote as what the Lord inspired him to write. All we need to do is to be careful, to be patient, to understand what the Lord told him, which is what we are doing here. So number five, Paul clearly preached about turning aside the tables of tradition, including circumcision, because the trust of revelation granted him was about life in the spirit, not in the flesh. You saw what he said in Galatians. You saw what he said about what the flesh could do. His epistle to the Galatians clearly shows this reality. Paul did not want saints to labor under the yoke of bondage to traditions of men and their religious rituals. However, number six, to drive home is spoiled. Paul pointed out what happened in the Garden of Eden when Eve upset the line of authority. He didn't want to guilt trip all women. He just wanted to show what could happen. You know, where Eve bypassed Adam, didn't inquire of him, and bypassed him and began to speak with a stranger who took the form of a serpent. I know that's what he means in First Timothy 2, 13, 14. This allusion was tied to the fact that false teachers who had reared their ugly heads in Ephesus were targeting women first and may have made some progress in their nefarious designs. So we need to know these things. We're just dealing with one of those passages. So let's look at the context in which the Alpha Church existed. Number one, the full counsel of Elohim was yet unfolding. You need to know that. You need to know that in that first century, the church was a work in progress. Any little light that comes, they work on it. Then the Lord brought Paul, gave them like fivefold before him. They didn't have it properly structured, so things were unfolding. So at various times, certain truths were fully understood and integrated into the practice of the church. For instance, in Acts 15, they convened the first Jerusalem council where the issue of circumcision was dealt with, and then some people were suggesting you have to be circumcised first, that is to become a Jew, before you'll be accepted as a believer. And then James, the junior brother of Yeshua, you know, born by Mary to Joseph, James was the presiding officer because uh, Peter, as well as Paul and Barnabas, were witnesses. They had experienced Judaizers, so they needed to be on the floor of saying what they experienced. Somebody needed to make the seat as the chair of council and make the ruling, and James made a beautiful walk, the wisdom of Elohim operated in his life, and James looked at everything and said, look, they don't need to be Gentiles, the Gentiles don't need to be Jews through circumcision before they can become Christians. So, the entire council of Elohim for the present dispensation of the kingdom had not yet been collated. The Bible was collated as a book much, much, much later. It was being downloaded, truths were being downloaded. As we saw, Peter marveled at the wisdom given to Paul and told people to be careful not to twist the word, rest with the word, lest they fall out of the way. As a matter of fact, by the time John received the awesome book of Revelation, almost all the other apostles had died. I think all of them had died. By AD 95, John was the only one of the original 12 alive. So, to successfully discuss women in ministry number four, therefore, we need to first go through the whole gamut of the world, the new covenant, what was said about the identity of the redeemed, the one who is born again, whether male or female, what does the world say? Who does the world say we are? If we get it, we'll be able to compare scripture with scripture. 
will be able to get the fresh inside Holy Spirit reveals and then by the grace of the Lord will be able to really deal with the issues that the Lord wants us to understand. Brothers and sisters, you know, uh, I know we, we, we started the lesson today a little bit late, but I'm just thinking whether we should stop here so that with the other, you know, we'll take it together next. Or let's 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 see what we can do. Let's see. Let's see. The other scripture we needed to look at is First Corinthians chapter eleven from verse three to sixteen. And so it's one of the places that deals with the issue where it says in verse three, but we'll have you know that the head of every man is Yeshua, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Yeshua is Elohim. There is every man prophesying, having his head uncovered, dishonored his head. But every woman that prayed or prophesied with her head uncovered, dishonored her head. For that is as if it were shaving, and then went on. You know, this is one of the scriptures that have been distorted. But we need to understand what the gain is the context. Paul was writing to the Christians in Corinth. This was a Gentile city. Idolatry was a big deal. Immorality, including male prostitution and high-level incest, existed in uh, the, the city of uh, uh, Corinth. The Jews of the diaspora who received Yeshua came from a culture in which covering of hair by women was a sign of reverence for Elohim. And the Greek women in the city had no such custom. In the city of Corinth also, you know, there were many, though the male prostitutes could be easily uh, recognized by the long hair they kept, looking feminine. As both groups met in the local congregation, the culture clash became an issue, capable of distracting from the main issue, which is worship of Elohim in unity and of spirit and truth. So in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul had dealt with the, another issue which caused confusion, which is like eating of things sacrificed to idols. And one principle he established is the principle of charity. You don't just say, well, it doesn't matter to anybody. It's my money. I bought, my, I bought whatever I want. I eat what I want. I don't care. No, he said, no, we must deal things in charity. If you know that eating things sacrificed to idols is going to cause people to stumble, those who don't have the kind of faith you have that there's nothing like an idol, you eat whatever. Those who are weak in faith, they may stumble if they try to do what you did. And their conscience will not allow them. So he had dealt with the issue of charity. So here, Paul was also trying to deal with the issue of fashion and reverence for Elohim. And then again, he also was dealing with the issue of relationship and authority. Paul made a strong case for the emergent Christians to recognize that for the sake of preserving order in the house of Elohim, Elohim had established authority lines, even in human relationships or marriage. In that order, he has ordained that no matter how anointed, beautiful, intelligent, and powerful a woman is, once she accepts to marry and marries a man, she has submitted to his leadership in the house. And the man who is now set in authority and covering over her needs to also walk under the authority of Yeshua HaMashiach. You cannot reject the authority of Yeshua and want to exercise authority. You do that, it's a distortion. So Paul was talking about the need to have these things properly straightened out so that the man should be under the authority of the Lord. So if the Lord wants to use your wife, for instance, like Joseph, a typical example, the Lord wanted to use his wife he submitted. He didn't go arguing. So if you didn't get a call and your wife got a call, your job is to give her the goal. You know, put blessed step behind her, encourage her, strengthen her, and be her chief biggest supporter. Make create the opportunity for her to be fulfilled. So the Lord was using Paul to address this issue of order. And the woman who is married. You don't do things as if you're on your own. No. If you want to be on your own, stay single. And there will be no restriction other than the Lord. And so, men and brethren, we also need to understand that he now told us about Yeshua himself. Now, he began to make reference in that first Corinthians 
11 uh, 10 he made reference to the reality that yeshua himself while in the earth was subject to the father he said in john 4 34 my meat my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work john 5 30 john 6 38 philippians 2 5 to 11 there was this overwhelming desire of yeshua yeshua behaved like a wife to his father in the sense of submission and Paul was saying that this is the way it should be in the household of faith among Christians. And let's take note that Paul also made the point that ultimately both men and women should be mutually dependent. He said it, verse 11, 1 Corinthians 11, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also of the woman. But all things are of Elohim. The reason for this verse is not far-fetched. Paul was not advocating that husbands should be tyrants who own their wives to do whatever they want with them. He was simply making a case for order. Then he also spoke about fashion in the presence of the Lord in the house of Elohim. In 1 Corinthians 11, 4-16, Paul charged the Christians in Corinth, and he did all things to remember that when people congregate in the name of the Lord, he is right there. And since he's there, Paul asserted that angels who are messengers of Elohim, they on standby to bring answers to prayer. So he asked that the woman should recognize the omniscience of Elohim when in the presence in congregational worship and use their hair to signify that they are under the authority of Elohim and their husbands, that they are under authority. And we've wondered what this means. And it looks over the years, the Lord has told us that there are some ordinances that may not be convenient, but that's what the Lord wants. And what he said here about putting something on the head, it's not oppressive. It's the same way like water baptism. You are born again, yes, you say, go and get baptized in water. After you are born again, Matthew 16, 15 to 16, why should you do that? Is it not enough? But it's an ordinance he put on. Now, participation in, in regular breaking of bread and wine in communion. Why should you take a, a, a piece of bread and uh, wine and say, this is the body? But it's an ordinance. Say, do it in remembrance of me. And also, the washing of feet. The leader, Yeshua, demonstrated and washed the feet of disciples and said, wash one another's feet. Why should that happen? Such a simple thing. You see, ordinances test our heart. They test our motive. They test whether we are truly under authority or are we like the people of the world who do whatever they like. And so that is why it's very, very important for us to know that Paul was not shutting down women in ministry. He was simply talking to women who are married, how to conduct themselves in the house of Elohim so that they don't disrupt by interruption, by all kinds of things. They don't also, so he said, if you have a question, ask your husband at home. The one he said in First Corinthians 14, don't speak. It's not that all women should not speak because in First Corinthians one five, he said, but every woman that prayed or prophesied, <laughs> prophecy is public ministry. Paul recognized everyone who prays or prophesied with her head uncovered dishonored her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaving. So prophecy is public ministry. He wasn't talking that all women should shut down and never do anything. He was trying to bring order in atmosphere of disorder, in places of confusion, where the liberation people had in the Lord was being misused. So, men and brethren, assignment. Number one, what issue in this lesson resonated most in your heart as a revelation or reinforcement of what you knew before? What, what, what are the points made? Two, please cite two scriptures religious people used to debar women from public ministry and briefly explain what Paul was saying. Three, what will you do with this lesson? So we thank the Lord that we are sharing this. Be patient. Get all the lessons. Don't jump at a one 
so that we can get everything right. And if you have questions, you can also send them by inbox. And one of the lessons before we end this course, we're going to deal with every question anyone has. Brothers and sisters, well, that's it for today. Please share this video. Encourage people to share it so that we can get it right. You know, my attitude to everything the Lord brings by revelation is this. Thank the Lord we are alive. That any adjustment we need to make, we make it while on this side of eternity. Because when we cross over, there will be no more opportunity to make any adjustment. So, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Now is that time. If we need to make adjustments, let's make them. If we need to do things right, let's make them right. But above all, let's stop abusing Paul for what he wrote. Because there was a purpose. A part of that purpose we have discussed today and we're going to build upon it. Share this video. Let other people come into knowledge of the truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to discuss your word. Now, Lord, we ask you to just have your way and glorify Yeshua. And as you are bringing clarity to this subject matter, Lord, do it to the uttermost in all the various lessons. So by the time we are through, will see your excellent mind and understand your heart and flow with you. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen.